Words are about to be spoken here on the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy, presented to you exclusively by Podcast Heat and the Ad Free Shows Network. I am John Alba, joined as I am every single week by the broken one, the woken one, the spoken one himself, Mr. Matt Hardy, coming to us from Arizona this week. How we doing? By the time I get to Arizona. I love it. Do you know who's going to this? Dude, you know me. I don't. I don't fucking know any of that shit. <laughs> you know that my uh, my periphery is so locked into when I get caught up in like certain artists or certain bands, whatever it is. That is all I think about. I don't think about anything beyond that. I just get so locked into. Hence, why I, I am mean, the way I am. I, I mean, I feel you. I, I think we all are at our core. That's just. I'm an obsessor over the things I like, and then everything else is just in my periphery at that point. But uh, good to see you, my friend. How's uh, your travel this week? I know you've been gallivanting all around the U.S. Uh, it was good. A, a little delay, but a very slight delay, which I'm, I'm okay with. So uh, uh, It was a, a very busy week slash uh, weekend, I guess, for myself and also the misses in many ways. We mm-hmm. actually uh, we were out in Nashville to do a little, do a little business on – Sunday evening and Monday had a, a couple little meetings and she had a, an interview with Bunny, who is married to Jelly Roll. Uh, people who know them, I guess they know them and they're they seem to be very popular. They're very beloved in many circles. And uh, Rebby did her podcast because she became a big fan of the Gothic Baby and Rebby's TikTok videos. So uh, we, were, we were out there doing that. And uh, then we got to hang out and spend a little mom and dad time in, in Nashville, which was lovely. Mm, okay. All right. In the town there, Broadway, Nashville. She have a good time there? Uh, she had a great time. And that, that was really important to me because, you know, I'm the one out bringing home the bacon and I travel and fly all over, you know, but I, I do get time away where I get to sleep in a hotel room and, you know, I'm not there monitoring four young children every second of the day, you know? So, so it was important that she had a good time. So we went out and I just, you know, gave her, you know, total creative control of our evenings and, and I wanted to do whatever she wanted to do. And, and she had a blast and I was, I was glad she had such a good time. Those two C's that Jim Ross talks about cash and creative and Rebby Hardy had control over both this past weekend. I like that. That's, uh-huh. <laughs> that's good. Well, I saw yeah. that you walked away from Nashville with a new gimmick too. Yeah. You know, she, she, uh, she wanted to be a mark for the evening. So, you know, when in Nashville do as Nashvillians, I would like to say Nashvillians, Nashvillians mm-hmm. do, uh, you know, and you rock a little cowboy hat. So she, uh, she gave me one. And of course I was going back on the road. So I just had to kind of sit back and rock it. And I tried to put some shirts and whatnot in my hat. So it didn't get bent too much in my check bag as I was flying out here to Arizona, but Hey, I'm in Phoenix. I can kind of rock the cowboy hat out here too. So it's all good in the hood. Are you a hat guy? You don't strike me as much of a hat guy. Uh, no, I mean, back in the day, I was a big baseball hat guy. That, that's probably it. You know, I'm a, I'm a baseball cap wearer, but not really a cowboy hat. So she just she just wanted to get a hat and she wanted to, you know, cowboy it up in Nashville. You know, and it, it was it was so crazy. There's one tweet I, I wrote, which was so ironic. Like on Broadway, we were walking down through there and there was one point where they're, you know, within 100 feet. Of one another, you know. There's bands everywhere. There, live bands nonstop in everywhere. Nashville, and, and then I could hear four different bands playing four different songs at the same time, and I could make them all out very distinctly, very clearly. And it's so funny. I was just, and I told her, I said, "This must be what Sookie Stackhouse felt like on True Blood because she, <laughs> she, she could read minds, and she would hear thoughts all the time, and they were like clouding her mind as they were doing. And it was just like all over the place, and it was so crazy. You have a favorite bar that you went in. Well, we we ate our meal at uh, either layer layer of cake, uh, okay. something with uh, layers of cake, which is a place that has like restaurants on each different level. We end up eating there. We went by Limousine, which is Dolly Parton's joint. Uh, we went by the Red Phone Booth, which is like a place where you have to go and put in the number, which is ironic because Rebby, being the spaz that she is, you know, like. She got this information. She's like, give me your phone. Give me your phone. Give me your phone. And she just like texts the number the, to the first person on my, and it happened to be you that I text last. And she's just like, <laughs> she just, da, 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 text. and you're like, what is this? Like, why are you texting me a phone number? I was like, I'll never get it. And Ruby said, have him ask me. Just have him text me. Have him ask me. And, uh, and it's just like, she just wrote that down. And then like, we got there and she did the number and then they like open the phone booth and you go in. It's like a, a secret kayfabe speakeasies and you go in and hang out, awesome. whatever. 
So yeah, I mean, we, we just we just hit a lot of joints like that, and she just wanted to go to those things over and over and over again, and and, uh, and we had a good time, and I'm I'm glad she did. Glad she you You pass uh, the legendary Tootsies down there. Uh, we did. We we walked right right past it. We definitely yeah. did. And, 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 and because uh, we we did pass Tootsies as we walked through there, and then just uh, just because she's not a pork eater, she's not a barbecue eater. Uh, she, her flight was before mine as I was coming out here to uh, to Arizona, so I actually stopped and had me some real. Badass barbecue too, so it was all good, man. It was a, a trip. You well, you know, Tootsie's is where they filmed the legendary "With My Baby Tonight" Jeff Jarrett music video. Right. Spend my days working hard on the go. I can't wait to be alone with my baby tonight. I think uh, my Easter egg for this episode is going to include songs. Okay, I'm down I'm with start, it. I think I think I'm gonna start putting out an Easter egg every week. I'm down with it. I, last week it was the array of beverages. I like it. Get get some get some in this week too. It's good with me. Uh, by the way, I know you didn't get a chance to see because you've been traveling, but go out of your way. We live streamed it on the My World uh, YouTube page. Jeff Jarrett gave such a beautiful eulogy for his father uh, yesterday as we taped this, and everyone should go out of their way to watch it. It was absolutely worth your time because uh, yeah. You're in Jarrett territory uh, this past weekend, so I, I, I didn't even realize the funeral was on that day. It's so funny. I got a couple of texts from people saying, "Oh, are you guys in Nashville to go to, you know, Jerry Jarrett's funeral?" And mm -hmm. I, I didn't even have any idea until like yeah. uh, I, I, I like actually I did a thing too. Like when I was with my wife, we like stayed off our phones, you know, you know, if, while we were together doing stuff, which is something I try and very actively do nowadays. Because sure. that phone will just like distract you, break the shit out of you. So, like you know, I, I really didn't look over any social media during the majority of time we we're there. I only posted a couple of things that I just wanted to from our experience in Nashville. But then I was I was scrolling through the next day when in the airport I saw this. I was like, wow, what what are what are the odds? Like uh, I, I had no idea. Yeah, go out of your way to watch that. Jeff gave such a beautiful eulogy uh, as he remembered his father's life. We spoke a little bit about it last week. A special thanks again to Matt Cardona last week who was just awesome on this podcast. He was great promoting the podcast throughout the week, too. Uh, anything you want to add about him? Yeah. I would just like to say, uh, yeehaw, partner. Thank you. Thank you, fellow Matt with two Ts. Uh, it was nice to have you on, and uh, and glad you joined us, and uh, look forward to doing it again down the road. He's crushing it. I don't know if you saw WWE uh, was in Ottawa for Raw this past week, and – they sent Chelsea Green to Ottawa, Illinois, instead of Ottawa, Canada. So she wasn't able to make the show as a result. And that, that caused some problems and some friction. Yeah, uh, that, that, that was that, that was very funny. And, and ironically, I, I think that was uh, actually maybe declared from a, a true life story back in the day. There was a time where there was a house show where there was a talent who was supposed to go from Toronto to Ottawa and ended up going uh, to Ottawa, Illinois for a house show. So, so maybe that was like a, a bit of a rib from a story back in the day. That, that's something that really happened. And that was the first thing I thought. I was like, oh, my God, that's a callback to that insane house show story. Yeah, he was great. That's cool that there was a little rib story there. I like that. Thank you again to Matt Cardona for hopping on with us. And we have a very exciting episode this week. It's one that you've been wanting to do for a while. And we're going to get to it in just a couple moments on the five-time, 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 five-time WCW World Champion Booker T. But it was a busy week in the wrestling world, Matt. There were a few things that went down that uh, we would be remiss if we did not get your thoughts. Take a dive inside the mind of Matt Hardy here. Uh, first yeah. off, I want to lead with the Elimination Chamber stuff. Sami Zayn versus Roman Reigns uh, in atmosphere like few other shows we've ever seen up there in Montreal. Sami Zayn comes up short here, a pretty controversial booking decision amongst the ranks of fans. You and I were kind of on the same page when we were watching it. What would you think of it? I, I don't think it was controversial at all. I, I thought it was uh, pro wrestling at its absolute best. I thought it was done so well. I thought uh, Sami Zayn having the match that he had against Roman, I actually went out of my way when you told me it was starting. I actually uh, went on the cock and actually looked it up. Hey, and pulled up the cock, huh? And watch the match. Yeah, yeah, I pulled up my cock. And I'm not talking about being in Nashville with my wife. I, I pulled up the cock and actually watched the Elimination Chamber. And uh, it was it was so well done. I mean, he, he had this super competitive match where he dominated Roman in a lot of it. And in losing, it still elevated Sami Zayn. And it's just the, the thing of Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns and the bloodline 
going to WrestleMania. That 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 is the, that is the path they should be going. I think that's completely right. I mean, just what do you do if Sammy does win the title? There's obviously other possibilities. You can't, but he 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 doesn't need it. He's so beloved. He he doesn't need it. And just keeping it on Roman as it is makes it's one of those things. Like already, people want to see Roman get beat, but who is going to be the guy that does it? And I think the the deal they did with Sammy, I thought it was done perfectly. He, he's going to end up having a tag team match, I'm sure, against the Usos. When it's all said and done, and that story built itself very well in that match, also at Mania, and, and it's going to be great. And when it's all said and done, two three months down the road, people aren't going to remember this, and they're going to talk about how great this winning the tag team titles and the reunion of Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn was at WrestleMania. Now I'll play advocate for this, just for the sake of argument here, because I, I am in agreement with you that I, I think they made the right decision, and I really liked how they played it out and. Truthfully, the way they followed up on Raw, too, they kind of left open the possibility that they could revisit Sami Zayn win the title down the line. So I'm, I'm okay with all of that stuff. The one mm. pushback I'll have, and it kind of took me seeing it in real time for me to really get into this. Sometimes you just got to give the crowd what they want, right? And it is undeniable that Sami Zayn winning there would have been an all-time great pro wrestling moment it would have been an all-timer it was a rabid high it would have been like punk in chicago like an all-time rabid crowd that was just super into it and on top of that Sami Zayn has proven to be a ratings draw for wwe he's drawing some of the highest ratings uh that wrestling has drawn in several years so even if you took a detour on your wrestlemania path maybe it's worth it to See what you can get out of this guy. Like, there's there's parallels to Mick Foley back in '99, where you know Mick wasn't going to be the guy. It was always going to be Rock and Austin, but Mick got so hot that they said, "All right, let's give it a shot. Let's pull the trigger." Uh, I mean, what do you think when I push back like that? I mean, you're in Montreal, and we obviously knew <clears throat> Sammy was going to be very over. You know, being from Montreal himself, obviously he was going to dominate the the audience in that event. But I mean, in pro wrestling too, you have to always remember the, the bigger picture and, and the greater good. And the greater good is like doing a title change at WrestleMania. I mean, I, I feel like that there could be, there could have been a scenario where they worked into a three way at WrestleMania, whatever, but, but, but I think it was the right call. Mm -hmm. And I think Sammy dominated that match enough. And he looked like such a badass star against Roman Reigns, a guy who has been pr protected more than any other champion in decades. I feel like uh, he went into that match he like gave an amazing performance. He would have won the way they had the match structured and set up in many ways. And then at the very end, it ended up being a very unfortunate twist of fate, which kind of cost him the the loss when it was all said and done. So I, I am okay with it. I, I get that giving people what they want, but I'm thinking of the bigger picture, the greater good, and that that's on a bigger platform, and that's at WrestleMania is where something happens like that. I also think you could have afforded yourself a Mick Foley kind of situation more if Roman Reigns wasn't on this iconic role of 900 plus days as champion absolutely i mean that's the greater good of this mm -hmm. like if roman had just been champion for a couple months sure you probably could have pulled an audible leading up to wrestlemania and then see how you get there from there but the first person that beats roman reigns it will be this monumental ah. deal and not to say that it couldn't be Sami Zayn because he's a world champion caliber professional wrestler absolutely like, I'll use a word that you use all the time. The equity investment has been made in Cody Rhodes being that guy. And unlike what happened with right. Batista 10 years ago, the crowds really love Cody Rhodes. They really like him a lot. So I understand right. where that's coming from. Yeah. Cody has been an investment by WWE. I mean, Obviously, he was an investment when you saw that he had that 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 injury and he still went to the hell in the cell. And he defeated Seth Rollins uh, three matches straight. I mean, it, it was very obvious they had big plans for Cody Rhodes. And and it's amazing because Cody is a guy who, like, left Alexandria, went to the outside, built himself up, helped found AEW, uh, and, and made it into a, a big deal and an actual number two pro wrestling company on, on the globe. And then he ends up leaving there and coming back to the WWE. And now he has all this equity, as you said before. He has all this equity, and they were definitely going to capitalize on that. And I, I think the people kind of see Cody as 
they see him as a bit of a rebel because he kind of left WWE on his own accord to go out and do his own thing and prove himself. And they always respect people when they do that. Uh, so, so I think the call to to go with uh, to go with Cody and let him be the guy to defeat Roman, I, th- I think that's the way to go. I, th- I think it's the right move, and I don't think it hurts Sammy one bit. If anything, that loss elevated Sammy. It didn't hurt him. It helped him. And it is something you can always go back and revisit, too, at some point, should you want absolutely. to. So, yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, and, and now, you, now you've got also – you've got a, a, a – built-in competitor for Cody down the road with Sammy, you know, that they can have a match. I mean, Sammy is a legitimate world champion level competitor now, you know, following this thing with the Brooklyn. I mean, it truly elevated him to a, to another level. And, and they, they did right by Sammy and it was the right call. I, I fully believe it was the right call. And, and on top of that, the internet is just always looking for something to be outraged about anyway. You know, that's almost and like how society is in this day and age. He pinned Roman. There was a phantom pin. He he got a three count, but there was no referee. So right. that, that gives you, again, that, hey, this guy's got the claim to be it. Uh, but that wasn't the only big wrestling event this past weekend. We also had this massive New Japan show in California where there were a couple things that could end up being kind of relevant to your neck of the woods there in AEW, Matt Hardy. First, your girl, Mercedes Monet, made her in-ring return after nine months, defeated Kari Sane to become the new IWGP Women's Champion. She got a superstar reaction. The match was outstanding. She looks so happy. And she said she wants to take that championship on tour. And immediately, my first thought was, man, if Forbidden 2 ends up happening later this summer, Forbidden Door rather 2, rather, Forbidden Door 2 happens later this summer, man, there are so many dream matchups for her and uh, someone from the AEW Women's Division. Who could you see stacking up against Mercedes Monet from the AEW Women's Division? Uh, I mean, I, I think when you're having a, a big marquee match against Mercedes, I, I think, you know, one of the first person that, that pops to mind is uh, is Britt Baker, obviously. I, I think Jamie Hayter would be a great opponent as well. I mean, th- there's there's a lot of great, great women. I, I feel like Britt Baker is one of the trailblazers of the AEW women's division in many, many ways. And it was kind of unexpected that she became the, the centerpiece of that division in many ways. I almost feel like that would probably be the biggest match they could have. See, I'm going to, I'm going to give you one more that I think could in theory be even bigger in terms oh, of the okay. presentation. Uh, Jade Cargill. I think that- Jade, Jade Cargill. It, I, yeah. I think their characters are very similar and there's a really good way to pit them against one another where you could get some great promos. And if anyone can help take Jade in the ring to that next level, it's someone that is as polished and just frankly good as Mercedes Monet is. She's so fantastic. And I think she's such a great seller that she would really add a lot to a match like that. Uh, yeah, that, that would be a big match. Let me ask you this, John. What do you do for a finish? I think it depends where Jade Cargill is positioned on the card come later this summer. I think that would be a, a pretty significant thing because, uh, for all we know, Jade could be world champion come this summer uh, in the women's division. And then I think that determines how you go with the finish from there. That that, that one might be tricky because I feel like Jade Cargill is kind of like uh, paralleling the Roman Reigns Mm-hmm. deal right now in AEW in the women's division she's like a dominant champion that's not going to be touched for a while and, and whenever someone beats her it's going to be a big big deal but also i feel like they need to be a full-time AEW. yeah person that's a valid point absolutely uh-huh. and then another one uh jay white lost eddie kingston he's not allowed to compete in new japan anymore he's a free agent you think jay white could be maybe born and bred AEW coming up here or could you see him maybe giving alexandria a shot uh, I mean, I can see either or. Uh, a very talented dude. Uh, I, I just met him recently when he did a couple of shots for AEW. Uh, nice guy. Seems like a good dude. Obviously, phenomenally talented in the ring. Uh, yeah, I can see him being at either spot, actually. I think he would be great in AEW, but I'm not going to lie. I, I kind of want to see what he could do in WWE. I, I think him in WWE would be a real sink or swim for him because he's such a unique talent and I could see him having an AJ Styles run in WWE and being very successful. So I could, we'll, I could, too. I could, we'll too. I, I also think he could, uh, you know, he could tailor make his wrestling style to fit the WWE style a lot more as well too. 
I just think AEW has so many great pro wrestlers on the roster already that because there's so many great ones, a guy like Jay White might even get a little lost in the shuffle. Not at anyone's doing. It just there's so much talent on the roster from an in-ring standpoint that there's only so many spots at the end of the day. So uh, we'll see. He, he could be very successful in AW as well. I guess we will find out soon. I don't want to waste any more time, Matt Hardy. We got lots to talk about with Booker T. Let's do it. Hit us with that Matt fact. Matt fact. Matt's pet peeves include wasting both food and money. Is that a natural thing? Uh, no, that's just, okay. just something in general. <clears throat> Coming up... Uh, in a very poor family, uh, food was like a big deal. And it was really stressed to us to always clean our plates and, and finish everything. And just now, because I'm in a situation where I am comfortable and I do have money, I, I really try and stress it to my children. If someone, if you ask for something and you want it, you need to, you need to eat it. You don't need to waste it. Don't take it for granted because I, I know how those hard days are. And that's something our dad was very, very big on at the end of the day. And, and once again, uh, I just, I work very hard and I bust my ass for my money. So if someone is going to spend it, I don't, I don't mind spending money, but like I want it to be utilized in the best way possible. I don't, I don't want it to be wasted. It, it is something that really eats at me and it's because I grew up so poor. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why. Good life lesson to offer everybody. I, I, I got to admit to you, I kind of have another Matt fact of mine that I'd love to make a graphic for. So I'm going to send it to you right now in the private chat because I would love to use this as a way to launch into our conversation and i think you can really embellish well on it so could you give us another matt fact here matt hardy indeed matt can dig that sucker five cinco five cinco five time champion sucker So you can, in fact, dig it, sucker. I can. Okay, that's that's good to know. Uh, man, Booker T, one of the one of the best ever to do it in the ring, and one of the most entertaining characters in the history of professional wrestling. Uh, in my research for this show, the segment before the first time you guys faced Booker T, he's backstage with Rob Van Dam and Test, and he's doing the whole five time WCW champion thing to RVD, and RVD just goes man, you lost the WCW championship five times? That's impressive. And Booker gives an old, tell me you didn't just say that. What an all-time character Booker is, no? Oh, yeah. no. I, I mean, as a character and just as a human being, he is an all-time character. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that side of Booker because I, I don't think everybody gets to see that side of Booker, the, the human being side. I mean, you, you can tell, and, and I'm sure, much like I just talked about how my upbringing and growing up in a very poor family and not having money and not having luxuries uh, really affected me and kind of forged me as I as I got older and, and the way I bring up my kids. You know, I, I want them to keep that in the back of their minds. Uh, Booker came up in, in a very hard environment. His uh, young life was, was tough. It was difficult. You know, he made mistakes. He went to prison for a while, and, and now that he – got his life together and, and he, he used all those things as life lessons. And you can just tell he greatly appreciates the value of his life. And also uh, the, the life that he has, the life that he is, has built and, you know, forged for himself. He really appreciates it. And every moment he's uh, around people that he's cool with, he's just enjoying life. You can see that he makes the most out of every single minute that he has. Yeah. He was the youngest of eight children. And by the time that he was 13, both of his parents had passed away. He was living with his 16-year-old sister and then eventually his brother Stevie Ray at 17. And as you alluded to, in 1987, he was arrested for robbing a Wendy's and he served 19 months in prison as a result of that. And I mean, Man, when you, when you go through shit like that as a kid and as a child, you know, especially if you're an intelligent individual, I mean, you get it and, and you don't want to make those mistakes again. And, and you want a better life for you and your family and, and your kids. And, and I know he's so proud of his kids. And uh, he, he really takes a lot of pride in, in being dad, too. So it's one of those things, man. I, I think that those are the things that, that shaped him. 
early in his life. And, and, and they gave him a more wonderful appreciation in life than, than most people ever get. And, and that's what makes him so special. I think, you know, always joking around. He's also very street smart. He's legit. One of the guys that you wouldn't want to mess with. If you were talking about having a dispute or a fight with him, whatever, he's very street smart. He's been out sad about Xander and he is a, he is a survivor through and through. But with that thing being, with that same statement being said, he's also very intelligent. He's, he's very compassionate and he's also just hilarious, man. He, he, he loves to make people laugh and he's one of the legitimately, legitimately one of the funniest, most care, charismatic guys I've ever met. I think he has some of the best comedic timing in wrestling history. He does. I think that is a big part. His, his, his delivery of those lines are also fantastic. Well, hopefully we'll hear some stories about that throughout the episode of the extreme life of Matt Hardy. But you know what about these Booker T fans? They everywhere. They remind, everywhere, remind people about that story if they've missed that in the archives, extremehardy.com. Don't even put a contraction on it. It's they everywhere. <laughs> remind everyone about that story if they might have missed that one. Yeah, there was uh, there was an incident where there was a little meeting called at a at a house show, and there was uh, some some inappropriate locker room conduct con conduct going on. And there was one point where uh, he mentioned that these uh, these in house rats, these in house rats in the locker room. He said they're everywhere, and he said people be professionals, get your shit together. That's basically what this came down to at the end of the day. I like that. So that lightened up the mood a little bit in the uh, <laughs> for, for, for most people. For most people. Got it. Okay. That's what I figured. Okay. Uh, well, so after he gets out of prison, he's training with Ivan Putsky and Scott Casey down in Texas, and he debuts as GI bro and his brother Lash becomes Stevie Ray. They go on the team with Eddie Gilbert, a, a pretty s sizable name from that era, and they become the Ebony Experience in global wrestling, uh, eventually becoming the tag champs. Uh, GWF, Global Wrestling Federation, uh, Global launched a lot of careers back down there in the early 90s. Bruce Pritchard was involved with that during his little hiatus from WWF at the time. Uh, did Global yeah. ever get on your radar at all? A, a little bit. There was a time where we got that, like on some random broadcast television station. And uh, I remember Jeff and I, we were like trying to, to seek out uh, the, the Lightning Kid because he was so small and it gave us aspirations and, and and hope that we could one day make it as well because we were smaller guys also so so we we were there looking for sean waltman the the lightning kid and then uh we actually discovered ebony express uh the ebony experience actually whenever we watched global and we thought it was cool because they were you know promoted as legitimate brothers and as far as we knew they were legitimate brothers and it turns out they are so we we always kind of dug that about them as well what did you make of their dynamic uh, I, I mean, I, I thought they were good. I thought they were talented. I thought they were big guys, and especially Booker T could do a lot of uh, really impressive aerial stuff and, and really exciting, these high-risk maneuvers. They go to WCW after a few years and, as we know, become Harlem Heat, eventually being paired with Sensational Sherry. Uh, what do you think Sherry added to their dynamic as a consumer? I mean, I think Sherry was just a good mouthpiece for them, you know, and, and just a character that could could speak. And, and she was also like uh, very good at, at, at her role, you know, whatever her character was. And especially just, you know, she was kind of like booked to be a bitch at the time she was with them. And I thought she did a great job of doing it and help help get them heat, I thought, as well. Perhaps she should have spoken a little more for them, because there's a very famous promo from this time where Booker is running down Hulk Hogan. He's just so hyped up. And he says, Hulk Hogan, we coming for you. And then drops the N-word. Uh, everyone loses it except for Mean Gene. Mean Gene somehow keeps it together. Uh, it's one of the funniest wrestling bloopers of all time. Have you ever seen this and uh, any reactions to it? Of course, man. You know, that that's that's an iconic clip. Uh, just the, the way Booker is so... He, he just like kind of caves in. He's like, oh, he's so disappointed in himself after he says that. Like, what did I just do? Uh, it is just incredible. So, yes, of course, I've seen that clip. That, that was that was something that kind of on brand for Booker, just getting so intense and fired up and then being Booker at the I, end of that. I, I, I think so. Yeah, that that, that is the, he was definitely very passionate about everything he was saying. And uh, he was he was, you know, speaking from his gut. But, uh, you know, he, he spoke a little <laughs> spoke a little uh, too much from his gut, I would say, especially with a, a TV camera on him with the red light on, you know, being broadcast to millions. 
he's just he's so intense cutting this great wrestling promo he's flexing his muscles while he's doing it we want the gold sucker and ironically against hulk hogan nonetheless uh, it is it is an all-time great wrestling moment uh any favorite harlem heat matches or opponents because they really come into their own and uh, they get over pretty big with the fans uh, i i don't necessarily know if i have like uh, one or two particular matches that stood out but but i i like them and i always enjoyed their matches they were they were a fun team to watch and and once again booker always shone through because of his athleticism i would say Sp- speaking of that i know there was one time uh, we're talking about Booker T isms. Uh, we were backstage, and he was watching Brian Kendrick and Paul London as they were doing stuff. He said, "He said, damn." He said, "Look at these kids. They ain't even wrestlers. They like the flying Melindas." You know, <laughs> I don't even know what that meant, so to say. But he would <laughs> that over and over. Damn, look at these kids. They ain't even like pro wrestlers. They like the flying Melindas. And then he would like look very deep into your soul. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, you know, Booker though. I think what made Booker so successful is that he could kind of do it all. Like he had the, he had the athleticism to be a high flyer or someone who was just really athletic in the ring, Mm -hmm. but the dude could freaking go and like could, could grapple. And I I don't know. Like I know that sounds remedial in me describing that, but he was so well-rounded. Was he not? He, he was. And also speaking from experience, because I, I worked Booker many, many times in tags and singles. Uh, he was also a very physical opponent, too, which which I did like. And I think that added to his credibility. You you knew if you're wrestling with Booker, like everything was going to be laid in. He was very, very, very physical. And he was cool with people being physical back to him. Well, Stevie suffers an ankle injury at the end of 1997. Yeah. And it's decided that Booker is going to get a shot in the mid card as a singles guy. And he actually beats Disco Inferno for the TV title. It's really not all that important. I just felt I needed to mention that he beat Disco Inferno for the TV title. And uh, eventually, he's elevated to main event status in 2000. Uh, You probably have seen this. I would love to know your guys' reaction in the World Wrestling Federation as this happened. But uh, Bash at the Beach 2000, July 9, 2000, Hulk Hogan is supposed to face Jeff Jarrett for the WCW championship and Jeff Jarrett lays down and Hogan begrudgingly pins him, cuts a promo on Vince Russo and walks out. And later in the night, Booker versus Jeff Jarrett is booked as an impromptu match where Booker wins the WCW championship for the first time. Do you have any recollections of that night uh, from your guys' perspective? It probably would have been a house show night, I imagine. Uh, Just all the things going on with WCW at that point. Uh, I mean, I, I think at that point, we, I, I think everything was kind of done. People were kind of tuning out of WCW. It was at that point where it was just so chaotic and just directionless, I feel like. And there was just so much controversy. I, I remember there being like talk of like, was this a work or like, what were they ac- trying to accomplish here? This, that, the other thing. Uh, and and I, I, I do remember that night. And, and I do say like, it's not a show that I watched. I'm sure I was probably working on a house show. Um, but yeah, it was just we just knew WCW was chaotic and, and people were very worried about WCW like spiraling downward and, and eventually going out of business. And lo and behold, they did. Well, Booker gets the win and in the process becomes the second ever African American champion in WCW after your boy Ron Simmons and the third to win a world heavyweight championship. Uh listen, Booker's on the receiving end of one of the most infamous moments of that era. What what do you think they saw in Booker at that time? You know, he's kind of still young, rising up the ranks. I know you don't know Vince Russo all that well, but what, what would have been appealing about a guy like Booker at that juncture? I mean, once again, you've got a guy who's never stepped into that territory of being a man of honor. And, and and if you have that, it's someone that is that is fresh and you it, it it, it doesn't limit you. You had someone who's already wrestled all these guys on top. Sometimes that limits what they can do and where they can go. You have someone like Booker. If you can build him into a, a top tier main event player, then you have all these openings and all these new matches that open up, these new programs, these new feuds, these new stories to tell. And I, I think Booker was Booker was smart. He had a good attitude. He had a good mentality. And obviously he was extremely athletic and he was very talented in the ring. And and lo and behold, you, you didn't really get to see a lot of it there, but he was also a very – very much a, a character performer as well, as you, as you see later on in his career. And he was doing the whole raise the roof gimmick there, too. That was getting super over. 
And uh, you, you mentioned he's a pro. I mean, this dude had to deal with so many insane gimmick matches in 2000. The land of Vince Russo, Matt Hardy. We're talking a straight jacket steel cage match and a San Francisco 49er box match. What's your favorite WCW gimmick match of all time? What what was the one that had like three cages stacked oh, on top? Yeah, they had the, the triple stacked cage that was in the Ready to Rumble. Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what, what was that called? Do you, do you uh, the exact name of it was... Sure you can pull it up right there. Yeah, I, the exact name was the... Um, Lincoln. I think it was just called a triple cage match, I think. Um, I feel like it had some sort of gimmick name. Maybe it, it did. was. Yeah, well, so the bottom one, that's right. Okay. So the the each cage had its own name. Right. Uh, it, was, it was just the triple cage. Uh, the bottom cage was called Caged Heat. And then there was Hardcore Hell. And mm -hmm. then uh, the Weapons Room was each one had three names that each one had its own individual name. I, I just, I remember seeing that and the structure looks so different and uh, being people like myself and my brother, you know, where if you have these inanimate objects and you can do a lot of cool things, it seemed like it opened up a lot of possibilities to mm -hmm. do stuff that had never been done in wrestling matches before. So that, that, that would have been my favorite uh, insane yeah, sure. match during that time. You were in a Judy Bagwell on a pole match kind of guy. Uh, not necessarily for me, but they each their own, man. A lot of things can be put on a pole, Matt Hardy. Mm. These poles, they're everywhere. So yeah. WCW is purchased by Vince, as we know. And on the final Nitro, he defeats, he being Booker T, pal, defeats Scott Steiner to win the WCW championship for the fourth time ever. And we know WWF officials were at the show. Do you remember there being any hype around Booker T potentially coming in? If he's winning the championship, you got to have an idea that he's probably coming in. Uh, it, it was very unknown at that point. I I remember hearing a little. I remember hearing a little bit of intel that just like several several of their contracted peoples were just being uh, you know more or less carry, carrying over to working for WWE now that we own that company and their contract. And the, these were the guys that weren't underneath the big Tom Warner contracts, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, yeah, we 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 knew a lot of people were going to come in, but we really didn't know who specifically. Mm. Was there a lot of uh, anxiety over that? No, well, there was an anxiety that WCW was going to now be owned by WWE and was going to be out of business because everybody knew it would be bad for business. I mean, everybody there just kind of dreaded it. Like, oh, this is, you know, they, once again, they kind of, <clears throat> we're already, we're independent contractors who aren't really independent contractors. You're, you're, you know, more or less an employee when you're there. <clears throat> and then once, the only leverage that you really have to like go somewhere different is gone. Everybody knew it was going to, to, to make for rough circumstances going forward. And, and it did. I, I think that's one of the reasons yeah. that wrestling just lagged so much for so many years, just that lack of competition, the lack of drive, which forced another company to, to really work hard and, and be the best they can possibly be. I mean, that, that kind of disappeared for a while. And I think there were a, a lot of, scenarios in WWE throughout the years following that they really showed like okay well we can still give people this because there's really no, nothing else they can watch booker takes a few months away after winning the championship here on this march 26 2001 final edition of wcw nitro and he goes home gets himself in good shape and you know want to know one of the reasons he was able to get himself in good shape matt hardy i i do it's because he was taking his AG1s every single day. 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sorts, superfoods, probiotics, adaptogens. They're everywhere to help you start your day right. It's a special blend of ingredients supporting your gut health, your nervous system, immune system, energy, recovery, focus, aging, all of those things. It's lifestyle-friendly. Whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, containing less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while still tasting good. Listen, I know you just had some of that Nashville cooking over there. Yes. You got to find a way to burn that stuff off, do you not? Yeah, I have to. AG1's helping you get that done. It does. Uh, it's the first thing I do every single day. And I was going to say, Booker T, he's a very smart man. So I'm positive he takes his AG1s every single day as well. 
Tons of people are taking some kind of multivitamin. So it's important to choose one with high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. AG1 is a small micro habit with big time benefits. It's one thing you can do every single day to take great care of yourself. And it costs less than $3 a day. You're investing in your health and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. So why wait? Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. Just one scoop in a cup of water every single day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D. And how many free travel packs with your first purchase? Five. Cinco. Five. Cinco. Five free travel packs. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash Hardy. Again, that is athleticgreens.com forward slash Hardy to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Hey guys, need to call a quick time out here. Wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling my listeners over at OU didn't know for a while now about all the cool things happening over at adsfreeshows.com. An all-new Mailbag series debuts later this month on Ad-Free Shows as we pick the brain of a man who has spent 40-plus years in the wrestling business. Longtime WCW and WWE referee Nick Patrick answers your questions. Stick Kurt Angle. Well, you get beer on it. Or mill. No, 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 it ended up being my own blood. Austin had, had, had the title. It had the little jagged edges on it, right? And it had a deal where, where uh, uh, Angle pulled me in and I took a belt shot. A little bonus content comes your way, courtesy of the Kurt Angle Show. A dream match became a reality back in 2016 as Kurt Angle squared off against Cody Rhodes on the Independent. For the first time, Kurt watches back his match against the American Nightmare. This kid's really talented. He's selling the ankle here on the leapfrog, went down on it awkwardly. He's outside the ring talking to the referee. This is, like you said, all part of the match plan. Hey, start to show that weakness in the ankle. Yeah, yeah, this was uh, his idea to uh, you know, make it look like he hurt his ankle so that when he did lose, <laughs> I love he had it. something to gripe about. Ad Free Show members have chatted one on one with AEW stars like Eddie Kingston, Dax Harwood, Ricky Starks, and many more, including a recent live interactive session with Renee Paquette. He still continues to do that. He's on commentary in AEW. Um, so it, I think it was cool for him to kind of put on that analyst hat and get to kind of test out those waters a little bit. But end of the day, it was a thing that I think made him feel like, you know what, wrestling can be okay again. I can have fun in the wrestling space again. And and now we have CM Punk Wrestling. So you're welcome. That's just a small taste of what we got waiting for you. With four levels to choose from, see for yourself why Ads Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adsfreeshows.com. Booker ends up making his debut for the World Wrestling Federation at King of the Ring 2001. He's attacking Stone Cold Steve Austin, and he actually injures him. Uh, did he take any heat for injuring the top dog here on his first night in? Yeah, there, there, there was definitely some, some heat. There was some frustration with Booker. I know from people back in the office. I know Steve was a little upset at first, but also Steve knew Booker, and they had a history together from back in the day, and he was – Steve was okay with it. Steve, Steve didn't hold anything against him because of it and understood it was a legitimate mistake, which obviously legitimate mistakes and injuries happen all the time in pro wrestling. This is, you know, this is a very physical sport, so it's going to happen. But, yeah, there, there there were some people that were probably a little down or disappointed Booker because that happened on, on that, that occasion. Especially since this is like your big debut. You're being positioned with the guy in the company. Right. And then you hurt him. It's I mean, that that can be something in Vince's WWF, is it not, where you might never get out of the doghouse there? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's there's definitely a doghouse. <laughs> uh, no no doubt about it. And, and people get sent there all the time. So it, it is one of those things you might have to work your way out of. And it, it's just WCW had such a rocky start right from the jump after they were acquired by us. You know, in just so many instances, it was one after another that kept happening. It was just, oh, my God, they were almost, you know, it seemed like they were just destined, destined to be doomed. And, and it just in Vince's mind, I'm sure it just proved him right. He he, he would say over and over, he said, oh, all these WCW guys are just, they're all stained. They're all tarnished. We got to do something to make these people in the stars. Really? He would say that openly? Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd heard him say that. Yeah. Wow. He said, he said that to several people. I mean, he just, the brand of WCW in general, because he said, if you're, and, and obviously, 
uh, being Vince McMahon, uh, being someone who puts a, puts a lot of ego and puts a lot of pride into his own brand. If you work for WWE, they make people stars. If you work for WCW, you're just like a pro wrestler. You know, so he has to like fix these people. He has to polish them up and turn them into superstars. Shine them up real nice, turn that yeah. some bitch sideways and stick it straight up a candy ass. That's what mm -hmm. some dude told me once or twice uh, every now and then. Uh, so you mentioned they kind of had some failures from the start there, Matt. Well, his first match with the company is one of the most infamous matches in oh. WWF history where he defends the WCW championship against Buff Bagwell in the main event of Raw. They change the set. They have all these different lights. They bring in different announcers. And it bombs. It I bombs. It. That was in Washington State somewhere. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. yep. It was in Everett or Seattle, so somewhere there. And it just, oh, my God, the, the, the people really, really rejected that match. And, and, you know, that once again, that made Vince feel like he was correct in his belief, you know, that these WCW people, they're, they're tarnished. You know, they have this WCW stain on them. You know, they're they're no good. And, I mean, I, I think part of that was, like, WWE fans were trained so hard to be pro WWE. I mean, I, you yeah. throw WCW people out there, they're going to reject them, I think, in, in some ways. And then on top of that, it's not like they had some match that was going to wow the people, too. So they, they were, they were kind of in a lose-lose situation. It's like if you were going to do that and you were actually trying to press them, wouldn't you put, like, Billy Kidman and – you know, some other high flyer out there to catch people's attentions and be like, oh, wow, this is this is really cool. This is not something Vince, we can... Vince would. Yeah. Because Vince Vince doesn't think about – he's not thinking about work, right? He didn't give a shit about that. You know, he's thinking about who, who are the biggest stars, you know, the, the, the most uh, mainstream wrestlers from WCW that I can put out there. That's, that's what Vince was trying to accomplish with, with doing that. Well, I also want to put in the main event of your TV program. That, that was also another you're setting it up for failure kind of thing. It just it was doomed to fail. And actually, that match bombing so bad immediately that week changed the entire trajectory of wrestling history because there was going to be a shift where Monday Night Raw was going to become the WCW program and then SmackDown was going to become the WWE program. And you were going to have two separate touring brands uh, every single week, WCW and WWE. That all gets killed immediately. And then right after that is where the invasion changes and ECW comes into the fold. And they just say, okay, the WCW guys are going to be heels. That's it. So that one match that Booker was involved in, man, like this is such a rocky start for him. And, and he eventually gets paired with The Rock where he wins the WCW championship again. But then The Rock wins it. Man, it just feels like this is not an ideal start for Booker T. Uh, did he have anyone sticking up for him saying, hey, man, just like stick it out or, or trying to pitch him to Vince? I, I mean, I'm sure he did. I, I'm yeah. sure he had his advocates in there. You know, I'm sure Bruce Pritchard was one at that time. You know, they have history, both Texas guys. Um, and 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 people, people like Booker, you know. But once again, like Vince always had in the back of his mind. The WWE is number one. WCW is number two. They never did things right. These superstars weren't – these wrestlers weren't trained to be superstars. I have to bring that out of them. You know, and then <clears throat> I just – I remember the frustration of everybody when it just ended up – every television program ended up being WWF or WWE versus WCW. It was very frustrating. And once again, WCW ended up being the Hills and the whole invasion thing. That it was just a very creatively frustrating time for people, especially when you had guys who were like legitimate Hills. And then if they're wrestling a WCW act, they almost have to half ass by default turn babyface. It was just a very, very weird time in the industry. On October, Booker and Test are the WCW tag champs. And on the October, October 8th Raw, you and Jeff defeat them in your first match ever against him. There's lots of interference. Lita's involved. Taker's involved. But you guys become the WCW Tag Team Champions despite never once wrestling in WCW. Uh, so what did this one mean for you, getting to add this one to the belt collection? I mean, anytime you add a, uh, an award to your collection of awards, it's always, uh, always an honor, always a good thing. Did you enjoy your first working experience with Booker? Were there any things, any any specific characteristics that stood out about working with him? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you could tell just right from the jump, he was just a very physical competitor. Some people, like <clears throat> once again, I, I my my favorite 
contrast of, of two people are using the two-man power trip. Um, Stone Cold Steve Austin and Triple H. Triple H is like very smooth, uh, very, very much a, a, a pro wrestler's pro wrestler. Very smooth. Uh, everything he does is very calculated. It's very precise. And, and he's not quite as physical. He's like more of a, a traditional pro wrestler where you, you work one another and you're not trying to really lay it in and hurt someone. And then you have someone like Stone Cold Steve Austin, who was a very physical competitor, and he was almost like an animal. His moves weren't predictable. And, and th that added a lot of realism to things as well. But they were like so – it was quite a stark contrast between those two because Steve was like an animal and Triple H was very smooth, very calculated in everything he would do. And, and Booker was one of those that was just – he was very calculated in the things he would do, but he was also very, very physical where stuff would be laid in. And it wasn't just like pro wrestling to the max. I remember one time Shawn Michaels threw some punch and he said, this is when we're just being extras, right? And, and someone said, oh, my God, that looked great. Did you like knock him out? He said, no. He said, I didn't even touch him. He said, brother, that's the art of professional wrestling, brother, if you're truly a worker. You know, and, and that's the difference between between those guys, you know, and just as time has gone on and high definition cameras and and people being a lot more in the know. I, I feel like people have had to lay stuff in a little bit more as opposed to like the whole pro wrestling thing, because people are much more inside the ring when you see stuff with all the technology that has, that has come around over the last few decades. Sure. Absolutely. That's a great point, too. That's not even something you really think about. Uh, all these different names are coming in from WCW. There's a lot of guys that come in. What was that adjustment period like when the locker room was expanding so much? And, and how did Booker vibe with everybody? I, Booker was always very liked. Uh, he, he was very liked. Um, and, you know, he, he was just very real, too. Booker was just like a very real person. He doesn't put on these facades or never never seems fake, you know, like he's trying to, to, to work someone, as many wrestling personalities do. Uh, but, but he got along with everybody, everybody really, really well. And I know there were a lot of people, myself and my brother included at that time. It was very frustrating because, once again, another comment that Vince said several times over ad nauseum. Uh, well, fuck, I've got to get these WCW people over now. You know, they you know, they, they have the stain on them. So we, we have to put them on programming. And there were so many young, hot acts, you know, like myself and my brother, you know, like an Edge and Christian, and guys like that who got a lot of TV time cut from them. Because these WCWs had WCW talents, which were an investment. And I get it. If you're a business guy, I get that. I would have done the same thing. Now they have to be on TV and he has to like, you know, shape them into his mold and how Vince wants these people to be portrayed on television. So it, it, it cut away from a lot of the TV time for the, the young, hot next generation that was that was up and coming at that time. Well, it also really puts a microscope on how many of them were actually successful. There's very few of them that were. Booker is one of them. Your friend Shane Helms is another one of them. There really weren't too many in that initial wave that came over and found success. Do you think that was just because of preconceived notions from Vince? Uh, that was probably part of it. They, they were going to have an uphill battle regardless. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that that same thing went with Booker. Once again, Shane was given the hurricane. That was, you know, an, an idea that they threw out there to do. And he's like, okay, well, fuck, let's, you know, let's commit to this and let's, let's do the bit and make it work. And I, I think that get that, that earned him quite a bit of respect from Vince because it was his vision and he was fully committed to the gig, you know, and he went out and he would entertain people. And yeah, once yeah. Again, Hur hurricane was a, a comedy character in many ways, but like, once you get over, you're, you're over. I mean, there's no if, ands, and buts about it. If someone like, if, Fans like you, and, and it's working, and you're getting over, you're getting over. That's that's what Vince is looking for more than anything else. Well, Booker's positioned in a bunch of wild scenarios after the invasion. There's the grocery store fight with uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin that cost the company $15,000. Find a church, they find a bingo hall. I like, the, I like the grocery store fight, fight. Oh, yeah, absolutely, dude. I just Austin jawing off. At Booker the entire time and the little one-liners and Booker selling big in that. That's unique and memorable, is it not? Yeah, dude, that's pro wrestling at the end of the day. I mean, it's entertainment. That that, that was pro wrestling through and through. I'm, I'm all about that. Yeah. Well, he and Edge feud over a Japanese shampoo commercial <laughs> that leads to a WrestleMania match. Right. Um, any thoughts on that? Uh, very, very random. I remember... <laughs> I, I, I don't know whose idea that was. Uh, I guess Vince probably walked in one day and said, damn it, Adam Goblin's got fucking beautiful hair. And then he just said, oh, let's let's do something about his hair. And 
maybe shampoo and we can build a whole story out of it and it can lead to a match of it. It'll be great. And then I, I, I know Brian Gortz was kind of given the assignment to like make something. Of yeah. It. That reeks of Brian Gortz. If reeks I'm not mistaken. So reeks of Brian Gortz. So. It's just, it's very, 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 very random. Just uh, like out of the blue, like where did, how did you pull this out of your ass guys? Like, where did this come from? <laughs> but you know what? They own it. And then after a brief tenure in the, WWE's version of the NWO, a very brief tenure. Uh, he gets paired with Gold Dust, and Booker is all of a sudden getting to show some of his personality. What do you think Vince saw in that personality? Uh, I mean, Vince loves those those odd couples, you know, the the odd bedfellows. You know, Vince is all about that, and and I I, I love them together. I thought they were show stealers all, all the time. They they were great as a tag team, even when when Dustin was doing the thing when he was you know and he got electrocuted and he was doing the whole stuttering thing and whatever that. I mean, I, I thought all that was very funny, very very entertaining. And it was weird because like Booker was a straight man, but then he was also very offended at all this outrageous stuff Goldust would do constantly. Was he always down the clown? He was down with all this silly stuff. Yeah, I, 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 he was cool with it. He he was very comfortable in his own skin at that point. I think Booker was cool doing all this stuff. There's that famous one where he's about to get down with a lady and he turns over and Goldust is in the bed wearing a wig too with him. Uh, and Booker, Booker, the beauty is Booker gets out of the bed, storms out, and he's just in his underwear. And Jerry Lawler reacts big. It's it's it was great comedic timing on all their behalf. And as you said, uh, he starts to get over for the first time in WWE as, as a big time character and player on this television program. Uh, you get a chance to wrestle him a lot in 2002. He's turning baby face. You're turning heel with V1. Right. Uh, how was he to play off when you were trying to find that character there? Uh, he, he was great. Uh, I mean, I always enjoyed working Booker and, and I know I'd ask you about it. There, one thing that I was really, really humbled by, I know he had done an interview at some point and uh, we looked for it a little bit, but I, I, I was, I was really humbled that he said this. He said, you know what? I remember seeing down at WCW, the, you know, the Hardys and, and the Hardy boys. And, you know, I didn't know how good Matt and Jeff were. And I know they did these ladder matches, these table matches, the TLC matches. And they were obviously that, that was, that was their thing. That was their niche, whatever. Uh, he said, but I got in the ring with Matt Hardy and he like mentioned me specifically because we worked a whole lot more than he and Jeff did. But like he said, I got to get in the ring with Matt. He said, Matt can work. He like he could go. He said, I knew if I was going to be in the ring with Matt Hardy, it was going to be a good night. He said, so, you know, the, the, the Hardys were really good. I enjoyed working them whenever I got the opportunity. And I, and I really got to see that Matt knew his stuff when he was inside the ring. So that was a huge compliment and really flattering that he, you know, thought that up. Yeah, you actually open up the Rebellion pay-per-view in 02 against him. Uh, the Undertaker's supposed to be there, but he's not able to be, so Booker replaces him, even though he's a Raw guy. And you guys open the show. Dave gave the match uh, two and three-quarter stars. I liked it a lot. I watched it back. This is where you said that the UK needed a Mattitude adjustment and that your mad fact, I believe, was that you liked English muffins, which was uh, a fun one. And and you you leaned into that, and Booker gets over big as a babyface. You remember that match? Any thoughts from that one? I, I do. I, I I do remember that match, and I, I like that match a lot as well. I enjoyed working Booker, and it was cool working him on a pay per view. And if I'm not mistaken, we were the opening match of that show, and they were really red hot during that. What was I, when I read through the notes earlier? What what did Dave say about that? About my mat fact? <laughs> he said. You have that there. In front he of said you. the Mattitude entrance video stated that Matt likes English muffins. I wonder what the Brits think of Americans who know nothing about British culture trying to make jokes about it. Very strange. I mean, obviously, <laughs> English muffins are like a big thing everywhere, you know. Uh, and and what, what, what fake outrage about that? And, uh, and, and, and never mind, he's a pro wrestling bad guy. He's out there trying to, trying to get right. people ready. It, it, see, like if you had said that you pr – pr Matt prefers American muffins over British over English muffins. Like, you know, there's there's that's classic heel, but you were trying to do something different with V1. And I, I liked it, man. I, I think that's good stuff. And the next night, uh, him and Rikishi defeat you and Brock Lesnar at a house show. I, I think this is the only time you ever tagged with Brock Lesnar. Do you, do you have any? I, I could be wrong on that, but I mean, I can't imagine it happened too many times if it did happen more than once. Uh, any memories of tagging with Brock? Um, yeah, I mean, it was 
once again, Brock's a machine. Uh, he's, you know, he really is the, he, he is the beast. Um, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed working with Brock. I know there was that time where he was feuding with Undertaker and I was kind of like a sidebar. A sidebar you know, like yeah. his, his minion working underneath when I got to work with Taker. Uh, and there, there may have been a time in there where we tagged like on a house show or something. I'm not, a, I'm not hundred percent sure of that, but, but I, I do remember tagging with Brock and, and I remember it was cool. And uh, it, it was great too being V1 where I could be, you know, a real, coward and and get brock in and you know to, to do my bidding and whatnot we're like oh yeah well i know you don't want to mess with me but how about you mess with this guy tag his ass in what a what a weird match yeah. right like booker t and rikishi yeah. versus brock lesnar and matt hardy what a melting pot of personalities oh my goodness you're not kidding here's something i really want to get into with you though so booker gets super over as a baby face because of this gold dust stuff Right. And in the beginning of 2003, he's on the, the fast track to becoming the main eventer. We watched in our archive, ExtremeHardy.com, the Royal Rumble 2003 episode. Uh, we watched the Royal Rumble match, and Booker comes out and gets a big-time reception. People are ready for this guy. Mm -hmm. The problem is, it's in the middle of Triple H's reign of terror. Booker becomes the number one contender. Did they, brand it, did they brand it as his reign of terror? No, that's what the fans branded it, and it became a, okay. it became a running bit. Okay. They should have leaned into it, truthfully. But uh, he, he wins this battle royal to become number one contender at WrestleMania. And this feud between Triple H and Booker T is maybe one of the most controversial feuds in WWE history. Uh, Triple H references Booker's nappy hair and says that he was there to dance and entertain people like Triple H, saying that people like you, meaning Booker, aren't supposed to be champion. There are clearly some racial undertones here. It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. And it comes under a lot of fire, and Triple H just pins Booker clean at WrestleMania. Booker really struggled to get back to that level again in WWE after that. What was the sentiment about this program in the locker room? And did you ever have any conversations about it with Booker or did anyone in general? I, I haven't. I would have liked to have known what, what Booker thought about it uh, in detail. I mean, obviously, uh, Booker was at that, at that, he was at a point in his career where he could stand up for himself. So uh, he, I'm not saying he was okay, okay, but I mean, he had to be okay enough to like still do it and, and go through it because I, I know he's, he was, very adamant about being involved in everything he was doing at that point. Um, and, and, and I feel like this is probably a, a Vince call and he thought it would be something that would probably get sympathy on Booker as a baby face. That's probably what he was going for. And I, I, I don't know if that was exactly the right way to do it, you know, because it, it is one of those things that society's changing and as times are changing too, it's kind of, you know, it's a pretty controversial topic. I mean, and once again, it's like when Vince had, you know, had that created for me, he wanted me to speak like a black rapper, you know, and, and just talk about how Mattitude was oppressed, like black culture, you know, which is, is I get what he's trying to go for. But it's like once you get with society and morals and like where we're at in U.S. history and culture, it's not really probably the best call. And, and, and I feel like that's probably where Vince was there. You know, maybe that's at a point where he's starting to get a little outda outdated. You know, if I'm not mistaken, a little later than that is when Vince drops the N-word on TV too, right? That's like a year or so later, which, you know, which is wild, you know, just so crazy. And Booker. Well, yeah, Booker, Booker, uh, he does it to Cena. And then, then yeah. Booker him with it. Tell me he didn't just say that, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Um, very, very, very strange, man. And, and I just, I feel like that probably – really sums up Vince McMahon in so many ways. He's just like out to be the ultimate entertainer. And he wants to like, you know, really try and touch hot buttons to like invoke, evoke people's emotions. But I, I feel like sometimes he's kind of like crossing over lines, you know, especially mm -hmm. as society and, and times are changing. That's and kind listen, of how I feel about it. Times have changed a lot since then, but even then, this was looked at as a pretty controversial thing. And oh, I mean, that, that's what I'm saying. At that time, times had changed. You know what I mean? We, we were in a, in a different era and like, you know, it's, it's one of those things too, like, you know, like race and, and authenticity and, and background. I mean, it was getting, we had to like make people equal and, and we couldn't like shit on one another. You know, that, that's kind of how society was changing at that time. But Vince 
once again was still like, well, we can go to this or we can go to that. You know, this guy's a Mexican, put him on a lawnmower. I mean, you see a lot of that stuff with Vince, you know, like he did with the Mexicals. And and I don't I don't think I don't think Vince did that like intentionally to try and be racist. He was just like, well, that's what, you know, th these people are kind of known for their culture. So maybe we should like roll with it. And, you know, th their people will get behind it or they'll feel sympathy for him. And, and I just I think some of that stuff was was pretty misplaced and displaced. Mm hmm. It just, it's worth discussing because here's Booker getting over organically, mm -hmm. not having to lean into any stereotypes. He gets over because he's a really good wrestler. He's entertaining as hell and people like cheering for him. They, they, they're into it. He gets to this point where he's feuding with the boss's son-in-law. Right. Like you said, you said Booker would stand up for himself, but you know, he's also got to play the political game there where, Yes, he's, he's feuding with the top guy here, who's the boss's son-in-law. And if you say something, that might get you some, you know, weird eyes thrown your way. And on top of that, let's call a spade a spade. Vince McMahon's track record of booking African American and black performers at that time was not very strong at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so the fact that Booker got over organically and in a very real way, and then was taken down a notch significantly i don't know man it just it's in my opinion it speaks very poorly to vince's mentality at the time right just my opinion a, 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 a question that i would really love to know now hunter triple h was very powerful at this time right this is when he's really coming into power and i i really wonder you know was this vince really forcing triple h's hand or was triple h like it yeah. I, I have no idea. I, I would love to know the, the answer to that, you know, uh, yeah. but, but but I don't, obviously. Yeah. And, and it just it sucks because it really knocks Booker down a bit on the card. And he is back in the mid card for several years after that. And he doesn't reach the main event again until he has to completely change his character, which we'll get into in a couple minutes here. But just it sucks that like organic booker wasn't good enough to be right. world champion i mean organic anybody in pro wrestling is the best possible case scenario always if someone gets over organically that is that is amazing Sami Zayn got over organically through his work with the bloodline you know i mean daniel bryan got over organically when fans were understanding more and like they just understood how much he busted his ass night okay. in and night out you know, yeah, I mean, anytime someone gets over organically, that is always the best case scenario because you, I mean, also fans have a lot of pride in that act as well. And they want to get behind them. They want to support them. You know, that's so important. And I hate, I hate diminishing someone when something is organic and then you try and shape it into something else, especially Vince's own vision, which he was, you know, always very guilty of many times in the past. Like someone gets over organically and then he has a Vince McMahonism that he wants to like kind of push this character into and like, this is going to take him to the next level. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, a, a lot of times that ends up being a mistake. And like, it did change over time. I mean, he obviously pulled the trigger on Kofi. He pulled the trigger on Bobby Lashley, which was a huge one given all of Lashley's history of start, stop, start, stop. He, right. you know, Bobby Lashley just got so undeniably, I mean, look at this guy. He looks like Thor. It's crazy. You had to pull the trigger on him. Um, it just stinks in hindsight because not to say that Booker T had a bad career. He had a hall of fame level career, but he could have been even bigger if they right. just wrote it and just let him be a top guy consistently by being Booker T. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. Just how I look at it. Um, so he does drop down to the mid card. You run with him on a few house show loops and some TV throughout 2004, 2005. It's mostly for the U.S. title. Uh, he also teams with RVD, and you guys have a tag title match with him. Um, did Booker at that point just kind of max out his character? Uh, was there maybe a ceiling to him not making an evolution from from that standpoint? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, he, he had he had done a lot obviously. And, and it was, I think he was kind of at that point where he needed to freshen things up and, and change. He needed to evolve in some degree. I know a way that we're freshening things up here on the extreme life of Matt Hardy. Me too. It's with our friends at hello fresh 
who are going to help you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You can skip those trips to the grocery store and not get in fights with Stone Cold Steve Austin, Matt Hardy. <laughs> by ordering Hello Fresh. Like, like, think about that. Think about that. Booker T would not have had to get his ass beat in a grocery store had he turned to America's number one meal kit, Hello Fresh. Is that true? That is true. And if this man would just use Hello Fresh instead of uh, destroying that grocery store, they wouldn't have to pay 15 grand too. Save like, the company some money. They like, could have paid. They could have paid me that. They could <laughs> pay me the money. That's right. They could have. They could have done that for you. But it's not just the fact that it would have been cheaper because they would have saved the fifteen thousand dollars. The reality is, Vince McMahon could have just gone to HelloFresh.com slash extreme sixty five and used code extreme sixty five for sixty five percent off his order plus free shipping. Even Vince McMahon, a man with much a much a much a paycheck, is willing to dish out a good deal like that, is he not? Indeed. You know he is. He likes to get a good deal on those New Year's resolutions that you're promising yourself. Maybe you want to trim up a little bit, slim down a bit. Well, HelloFresh is here to help you eat better every single time by delivering fresh ingredients and easy recipes right to your door, taking all the hassle out of dinner time. And no matter what your lifestyle is or your meal preferences, HelloFresh has recipes sure to please everyone at your table, from fit and wholesome to veggie or family-friendly. I feel like they just encompass the entire house hardy in that description there, Matt Hardy. All right. <laughs> You'll always find something that even the pickiest eaters will enjoy. Who's the pickiest eater in house hardy? Wolfie. No doubt. I figured Wolf, that as well. Wolfgang Xander Hardy. And by the way, I got to say, did you mean to say 65% or did you mean 35%? No, I said 65%. That was deliberate. 65%? 65%. 65%? 65%. 65%. Tell me you didn't just say that. I'm going to order as soon as we finish this podcast. <laughs> that is a two thirds discount on yeah. HelloFresh by using. Uh, the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy's offer there, HelloFresh.com slash Extreme65. Use code Extreme65 for 65% off. Plus, free sh I know, it's insane, dude. I mean, we're talking about we're talking about some of the most robust recipes in the world, like falafel power bowls, some seared steak and potatoes, Southwest pork and bean burritos. Mm. I'm just saying, man, this is stuff that is farm to table friendly in less than seven days the ingredients go from the farm to your plate fresh at another definition my friend i've been using hello fresh for a long time on and off i can tell you when i was in tv finding time to grocery shop was so difficult for me because i worked these insane hours so it was so convenient when HelloFresh would just ship it directly to me. I could cook it real quickly and I'd have my meal ready to go for the day. And for someone like you that's on the road and for someone like Revy's dealing with all the kids at home, this just makes it so simple, does it not? Indeed it does. And it's tasty too. Who doesn't like tasty food? The tastiest. HelloFresh.com slash Extreme65. Use code Extreme65 for 65% off plus free shipping Hello Fresh, America's number one meal kit. And I endorse that wholeheartedly. So let's get back into the Booker T diatribe here. He's kind of reached that threshold. He's just going to be a mid carter. We know authentic Booker T is not going to get him to that next level. Fair or not. Right. So he reinvents and he turns heel. And his reinvention actually begins. By defeating you in the 2006 King of the Ring quarterfinals. Of course, brother. There's there's no better way to put somebody on a path to great than by being <laughs> Matt Hardy, brother. Would you? What would you have done with a King of the Ring gimmick, Matt? Oh my. Um, I mean, I, I guess it depends on what it was. Uh, being a bay face or heel, I would have probably chose to to be a heel. I would uh, imagine. And uh, it, it would have probably been like V one. Turned up to uh, turned up to fifteen, you know yeah. what I mean. That I am royalty. I am an elitist more than anyone else. Like I wouldn't even speak to certain people because they were beneath me. You know, I, I think I would. I would definitely turn it up to the max. I like that. Just, just something to ping your brain about. I know you're a big Macho King guy, so yeah. Could've, and could have seen some info. Maybe you should have started doing an elbow drop as your finisher at that point. Maybe I should have. 
Maybe, maybe, maybe my hips would have been less speed up if it was the elbow drop where I kind of landed half ass on my back as opposed to a leg drop where I destroyed my pelvis day in and day out. Might have helped out, but unfortunately, it's not meant to be. You lose to him in the quarterfinals. He gets a bye to the finals after Kurt Angle can't compete, and he defeats Bobby Lashley to become King Booker. He, he establishes. To, say, to, use another, to use another Booker line, uh, he said, couldn't have happened to a better guy. So there, there was a guy who had a bunch of heat who uh, Booker wasn't a big fan of anyway, and he was out on the apron, and he slipped off and fell down and busted his ass and made a fool of himself. And I remember Booker was watching a monitor and just turned around with a big smile and said, couldn't have happened to a better guy. That's a that's a line that uh, is hit very often. That's a Booker T-ism, getting those in. So, so are you keeping up with them all this, this, this week so far? We've got, they're everywhere. Couldn't have happened to a better guy. And then also, shit, they don't look like wrestlers. They look like the flying Melinda's. <laughs> Can you give us a little insight as to who that might have been that he was referring to? Or, or is that meant for the... Uh, yeah, meant for the I'm going to leave, I'm gonna leave that up to your imagination. Okay. Right. I like how I say it in Jeff's way. Your imagination, as opposed to your imagination. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Uh, so he... Does, it make you mad? Does it make you mad, John? Well, no. if it does give me the heat, <laughs> I want it. I know I'll get you to tell me off air anyway, so it's fun. But um, so he establishes a royal court with Queen Charmel, Sir Regal, and Sir Finley. He's talking with a British accent, except that this is the best part of it, that when he gets really pissed off, uh, he becomes the old Booker T again. And then he snaps right back into being prestigious and royal. What do you think of the presentation here at Booker T as King Booker? Oh, I, I loved it. I love the voice. My favorite thing. Who is this rogue? <laughs> who is this rogue? That was my favorite King Booker line of all, all of his lines. Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed the shit out of all that <laughs> when Booker was doing it. Super entertaining. Super fun, I thought. Well, because when people do the King of the Ring gimmick, to me, it can have like turn off the tv heat because it can be really stupid but there was something charming about booker doing this maybe just because it's such a juxtaposition of who he actually is that he's doing this over-the-top british character what do you attribute the success of it to it's a british hood character i love it <laughs> depending on his level of anger uh i i i don't know i mean i would imagine I would imagine, and I, I don't know this is factual information. Mm -hmm. The book, well, you know, kings back in the day, especially there were kings and you know in in Europe, and you know they would speak. You know, the, there's a king in you know Britain in England. You know, they would probably talk British. You know, oh, may, maybe I'll talk like that, and I'll really exaggerate it, and and like be outrageous with it. And I would imagine that's almost where it started from. Probably. Yeah, it just it was so bizarre for him, but it worked so perfectly. What did you think of including Charmel in the package? I, I, I thought that was great too. I, th I thought that worked really well. I really, I love that moment I have at WrestleMania where we're in a money in the bank match and uh, Booker's going up and he's about to win. And like Charmel comes in to grab me or stop me from doing it. And I turn around and I have her in a twist of fate. I said, if you don't come down right now, I'm going to drop her Booker. I'm going to drop her. I'm going to drop her. And he, he's just so torn. Like he's right there by the briefcase. <laughs> oh, I'm going to save my wife. Then I kick him and drop his ass, you know? That was a, a real fun fun moment in that match. Uh, it is good. She she was great as an accomplice to him. I, I yeah. really like that, and I, I think it starts to make an impression on Vince McMahon here. How did Vince start coming around to the King Booker character? I, I mean, it, that that's right up Vince's alley. You know, entertaining, over the top, outrageous, half ass absurd. You know, but like whenever he needs to like turn it up and get serious, he can. I mean, that that's a tailor made character for Vince, and that's what he's all about. So I'm sure, I'm sure he dug it. Well, so much so that at the Great American Bash, Booker defeats Rey Mysterio to become World Heavyweight Champion, mm -hmm. and he's the first ever 100% Black World Champion in WWE. It took for Booker to reinvent as this super over-the-top character to get the call. 
Everyone knew he had the talent, but it took him stepping as far away from his authentic self to become world champion. And I think when you contrast that to the conversation we just had, I don't know, Matt, kind of makes you think a little bit, doesn't it, about Vince's perception of things and just how the pecking order worked at the time? Yeah, and and it also, I I think it also speaks volumes about how now it seems like a professional wrestling character that Vince can get behind. I I mean, I I, I could see Vince telling Booker, this is some of the best character work you've ever done. Some of the best character work you've ever done, you know, and 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 it and it fit, you know, it fit perfectly in Vince's mind as what he wanted from Booker at that time, you know, when he started doing it. So I, I feel like that's mm-hmm. once again, it, it it Vince feels like you're doing work that he loves, that he has a hand in creating. Then I mean that that's the way to that's the way to his heart. <laughs> yeah. That's the that's the way to a push. That's the way to you know, you know, gaining success and and money you know, the Vince McMahon, you know, so, so, so I, I think it just worked out for him. It was perfect timing and, and Booker took a, uh, an opportunity and a situation and he made the most of, of it and uh, he, he made it work. And, and I just want to say too, like, that's not me pointing fingers or anything or, or anything like that. It's just, I think it is a really interesting case study into Vince's way of booking in that time period and his, approach and and his vision for how he saw different people in different roles and it it took for booker to and to his credit step out and create this extremely entertaining and over-the-top ridiculous character that got over big that it just was so undeniable at that standpoint right speaks a lot to booker's credit uh and and his abilities as a performer too um what do you think uh, at the end of the day, this Booker, this King Booker run, uh, is is that one of the more memorable world champions WWE has had? Because I can't think of too many world champions that were super gimmicky in the modern era like that. Uh, that's a Racky pretty solid point. There. Yeah, it's a pretty solid point. I, I really hadn't even thought about it like that. But yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. World champs, man, they, they're not typically like that. So I just... I. Something interesting to think about. Um, In the spring of 07, you have a little run with him on TV and on house shows, and you actually win your final match ever against him on April 3rd, 2007. Uh, He's he's really at the top of his game here, and uh, you get the last laugh, Matt Hardy. How about that? A rarity, but you get the last laugh here. Hardy, hard, 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 hardy. (laughs) Is it insane to you that it's been 16 years since you last wrestled Booker T? Yeah, it's it, it has. Just my whole wrestling career has been insane. The fact that I'm on year 31 has is, is been insane. Yeah. He'd leave WWE at the end of the year and have a run in TNA before coming back and settling into some part-time roles and commentary. Uh, and he had what he says will be his final match at this past year's Royal Rumble when he was in there for about 25 seconds. Uh, he's a trainer now in Houston alongside doing NXT commentary. Uh, what do you think about Booker would make him a great trainer? I mean, he, he's he's a very driven guy. He's very smart when it comes to in the ring work, uh, like fundamentally and putting a match together, telling a story. And and I feel like that's something that uh, he always – I feel like it was important to him to give back. I feel like probably because his childhood was, was so rough and, and so tough and he kind of had to find his own way. And, you know, obviously he fucked up and made mistakes uh, along that path. I feel like him training younger people gives him an opportunity to kind of give back in a positive way and try and teach people the right way to do things. Or, or even on top of just being a, a, a good, solid professional wrestler, even the right way to live life. I feel like that's something that's important to him. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's crushing it in that sense. Uh, do you enjoy Booker's commentary? Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, Booker's funnel commentary. You know, just just like we've talked about before, his charisma and his just very witty, funny personality. Obviously, those things are interjected whenever he's doing commentary, so I enjoy it. Get down with a little shucky ducky quack quack. Right. Yeah. That's his uh big yeah. thing now yep. over there on commentary. His just talking about his accolades here. His twenty one WCW titles render him the most decorated wrestler in the company's history. Oh boy. Which, uh, I think is pretty amazing. Um and you add in that 
he's a Hall of Famer as a tag team guy, as a solo guy. What do you think his legacy is in the industry? Uh, I mean, I, I think he was, uh, once again, I think he was a tro- trailblazer for a, a black singles competitor. I think he was a trailblazer for a black tag team competitor. Uh, and he's a guy who broke a lot of barriers. Um, and, and he was able to achieve a level of greatness that uh, a, a lot of black people weren't able to. So I, I think he'll always be remembered for that. And uh, I was doing my research for this, and, and he even said last year when all the stuff with Jeff uh, talking about how he turned down the Hall of Fame induction because he wanted to go with you, Booker gave Jeff a lot of props for that because he felt like the Hardy Boys should go in together. And that that was something he had really wanted to do initially with Stevie because he felt that was what made him part of his identity. Right. Yeah, yeah and, and, and that, that, that's definitely the mindset myself and Jeff both have, too. Yeah. You got any time to answer a couple questions here? Yeah. Yeah, man. Let's do it. Josh Henney, who uh, had some health issues this past week, and we sent him nothing but the best. Yeah. Um, Feel better soon, Josh. Feel better soon, Josh. He says, did Booker T teach the Spinner Rooney to other talent? No, no. uh, Booker didn't. But there there were several times uh, there would be, like, multiple men – house show matches like main events or whatever. Like I know you talked about, you know, I ended up being teamed with Batista and Undertaker a lot where there'd be like eight men. There were some eight man tags that closed out house show matches, some other deals. And there were a couple times where maybe there were even like run-ins at the end of a Booker match and Babyface would be out there. And Booker's deal to send everybody home happy was to like have everybody do the spin a rooney. So I was involved in a couple of those. I got a shitty spin a rooney. I mean nobody can do it like the master Booker T. You know, but uh, I'll tell you someone who wasn't going to ever do the Spinner Rooney, and that was Undertaker, who who fought it very adamantly. Yeah. So you have it. What What's the key to a good Spinner Rooney? Uh, I I don't know. I can't do it. <laughs> I, I think a lot of it is just the momentum and the way you're spinning and turning around. I've done a couple of decent ones, but usually mine was usually worked and very exaggerated. Very 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 broken Matt Hardy Spinner Rooney. Wrestling match study podcast says Matt. Did you laugh when Booker T said King Booker? I, I mean, I did. I, I laughed at so many things he said, you know, once again. Just that line that he would say about anybody he wasn't familiar with or someone who didn't like him would say, who is this rogue? I mean, that was like I was stuck saying that just in general because it was so catchy and I loved it so much. But, yeah, whenever he did King Booker, I love that dragging out of, of the, uh, the uh, AH at the end. Of course, absolutely. A great, great wrestling character from uh, that era. Uh, Let's see. We have Mike asked, does Matt recall the first time he met Booker T? Um, I want to say there was a point we were in Toronto and Edge and Christian wanted to go across the street because WCW was in town as well as WWE. And we went over there and it was the the first time the, the, the big point of the story was it was the first time we met Benoit and it was a hell of an experience when he tried to pound myself in Jeff's fist. But I, I, I met Booker there. I feel like that was the very first time I met him just in passing, just like, Hey, what's up? Nice to meet you. Uh, you know, and then obviously when he came to WB, I'd, I'd met him and ended up being able to work with him several times. But I, I feel like that was the, the first official time I met him. And it, it probably didn't stand out as much because I met a lot of WCW people for the very first time then too. Austin Williams wants to know, what did you think when Booker T went to TNA in 2007 and how did it help the wrestling business and Booker himself? Uh, I'm not sure how tuned into TNA you were at that point because you're super on the road, but he was doing the main event mafia stuff. And that was kind of the last chapter of his career really in the ring. Yeah. I I mean, once again, it it was good for business because TNA were trying to be a, a rival or a competitor to WWE, they were trying to be like an alternative brand doing their own thing, you know, trying to, you know, forge their own path. So, so I, I think it was a positive, you know, that he went there to help them out. And I think for him too, he'd done so much stuff in, in, in WWE. It's sometimes you need a change of scenery to kind of like revitalize yourself. So, you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't hate that at all. And, and I do think that's a good move. I, I think sometimes, I thought Chris Jericho was like the master of it because he would work in WWE for a while and then he would take time off and then he would kind of come back and be, be fresh. I feel like when you work someplace for so long, uh, you end up kind of becoming repetitive. 
And sometimes you need to freshen up your act. Sometimes you need to go where there's there's new wrestlers you can wrestle, you can compete again. I think that kind of keeps you fresh and also kind of helps with your evolution to a degree. I would. So yeah, I, I, I was I was okay with Booker one. I know towards the very end he got very very frustrated with TNA. You know, and ultimately ended up coming back. But uh, uh, I, I think it was uh, it was best for business in the big scheme of things because anytime there's something else else out there, an alternative product as opposed to just one wrestling product, it's good for the industry and it's good for the talent as well. Yeah, I also want to shout by the way. Um, I know you kind of talked about Booker mentoring talent now. He's done such an amazing job with Roxanne Perez, who I know you probably haven't seen too much of. She's the NXT Women's Champion, right. and he trained her, and now they're together in NXT. He did such an amazing job with her, and she's incredible. Uh, she's going to be a big-time star for WWE, and I think that's going to be a big part of his legacy as well. And I got one more question here from Cole Williams. It says, how do you think a match between the Hardy Boys and Harlem Heat would have gone? Uh, that would have been a lot of fun, especially like if you, you take everybody in their prom, you know, and, and be able to have that match together. That, that would be so much fun. Uh, I think that's still something that would be fun. That'd be a fun cinematic match somewhere down the line. Maybe, you know, we could dress it up and, and kind of uh, take it easy on, on Booker and Stevie and actually myself and Jeff too, who I'm a kid. But that, that'd be a fun little <laughs> cinematic match to have and uh, do the, the first time ever, you know, Harlem oh, yeah. versus the Hardy Boys. What would Broken Matt refer to Harlem Heat as? The Heat from Harlem. The Heat from Harlem. Okay. Yes. I like that. I like that. That's good. Hey, man, this is a fun episode talking about your pal Booker T. Anything else you'd like to add on Booker and what he means to you and your friendship with him or anything of that nature? Yeah, I, I dig. It's it's very cool whenever I, I do get to see him. I really enjoy like seeing him and catching up. There was a time that we got to hang out. Uh, before I'd left WWE to come to AEW, we had an appearance at a Houston Astros game and we were there and we got to eat and have dinner. We were talking about family and kids and just different things and life and reality, you know, but, but I always enjoy those conversations with them for sure. And you were talking about a school, you know, back in the day, I know me, I want to say it was me versus Hurricane Helms versus maybe Shane Helms when he was a Hill. We, we did a match for Booker at his school, his promotion one time. Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, memory may not serve me correct because I have been hit over the head, uh, you know, hundreds of times with chairs. But I, I, I'm pretty sure I, I definitely did Hunter's show for him, uh, his school and his promotion. And I'm pretty sure I wrestled, wrestled Shane there when Shane was a hill and he left, you know, when he kind of like uh, left from doing the hurricane gimmick and he was Gregory Holmes. And, and I enjoyed it. It was fun, fun being in, uh, in Houston, hanging out with Booker and doing the show. Yeah, he's an all-timer, in my opinion, man. I've always thoroughly enjoyed watching Booker T matches. I enjoy him as a character. Uh, and he definitely is not one to shy away from sharing his opinions. I'll, I'll tell you that. It's definitely had him in the headlines in recent years. And you know what, man? When you've got that street cred, flex it. That's that's as far as I see it. He does, man. He, he has got street cred, and he is very street smart. And and once again, he's he's one of those guys that's like very legit. You know, he's not like a Brock where he has like all these years of training and he knows how to wrestle and knows how to do this and that. I mean, he just he's very street smart, got street cred. He's like someone who'd whip your ass in a minute. No oh. doubt about it. Uh, this this is a five cinco five cinco five star caliber episode, in my opinion, Matt Hardy, uh, especially because of our friend Booker adding a little street cred to that. Uh, so thank you to everyone for checking this one out. Please leave those five single, five single, five star reviews for us wherever you get your podcasts. Matt and I have a very cool ad free shows exclusive Ask Matt anything that's going to be dropping this week as well on yes. adfreeshows.com, where just ad free shows subscribers are able to ask questions. So uh, head on over to adfreeshows.com. You can subscribe for as low as $9 a month. And uh, have some fun with us there, because uh, I know Matt loves doing these Ask Matt Anythings, especially with yeah. top guys, top gals, and everyone in between. And then we have a very special event coming up in the beginning of March for ad-free shows, my friend. Uh, we're going to be watching a very special match, are we not? We are, yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to be watching TLC 2, which I think is the best TLC of all the matches we did. Yes, we are going to be watching TLC2 and taking questions live from Ad Free Show subscribers in the beginning of March. More details about that in the next week or so. So head on over to adfreeshows.com and make sure you're subscribed to that. And also, if you're a business out there that would like to get your name put amongst the likes of HelloFresh and 
AG1s, Athletic Greens, well, we want to direct you over to uh, our special advertising website where you can find out more, advertisewithhardy.com, where you can find out all the details about how you can join up with the extreme life of Matt Hardy and get your message out in front of thousands of listeners and watchers and viewers every single week. And on Matt Hardy social media, Matt Hardy, your retweet, your quote tweet, that is a powerful, powerful, powerful tool, is it not? It very much is. It very much is. Social media is the best and it's the worst. But when you're advertising, boy, howdy, is it the best? I promise you that. <laughs> it's a double-edged sword. I'm on a corner waiting for a light to turn on. You got a great voice. Someone should put you on a CD with John Cena someday. <laughs> Just the thought, my friend. I wish I could really sing. I, I would love that. I, you know, you gave us a little with with my baby tonight earlier. I like that. That was good. Yeah. It's, yeah. There's, there's another. I put something in the beginning. I put something in the end. That means uh, the people that are going to answer this Easter egg have to watch the whole episode. That's right. Stick around, <laughs> guys. Make sure you tune in every single week to the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy and subscribe at ExtremeHardy.com. Anything else you want to add this week, my friend? Uh, no, this was fun, man. Fun, uh, fun uh, walking back in time and uh, talking about the great Booker T. The words have been spoken. We'll see you next time right here on The Extreme Life of Matt Hart. Adios, amigos. All right, by now, guys, you know, I love talking about old wrestling. What you might not know is it's not my real passion. My real passion is helping people save money. My real passion is getting families out of apartments and into houses. My real passion is getting people's finances aligned so they can retire on time. I hated going to Walmart and seeing the greeter being 80 years old. She should not be working. She should be home. Why is she still working? Because she still has a mortgage. I want to help avoid that for you. The other thing I want to help you with, let's make sure your kids don't get saddled with student loans. If you've got a student loan, why did you get one? Maybe because your parents still had a mortgage. I'm not saying that to be funny. I'm being sincere. There's only so much money to go around. What I want to help you do is figure out where you are right now and where you want to be long-term. And I do it at SaveWithConrad.com. I've been doing mortgages for more than 20 years. And during all that time, we've helped tens of thousands of families change their life. I mean, routinely, we're helping our podcast listeners save five, six, seven, eight hundred bucks a month, but more importantly, get them out of debt faster and with cheaper monthly payments. But if you don't think it can happen for you, let me just tell you this. We are not the bank. We don't say no. We say not yet, but here's how. We're going to get you a game plan on how to improve your credit, how to save a little bit of cash and how to get into that dream house. Maybe you're already in the house, but it would be nice if someday we could put a pool in the back or one day we want to upgrade the hardwood floors or remodel the kitchen or get a badass master bathroom. I can help you do all of that with no money out of pocket right now at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. And if we can't help you save some cash, we won't waste your time. Check it out. SaveWithConrad.com, NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. And hey, y'all, don't take my word for it. Check us out. We've got an A-plus with the Better Business Bureau. And as if that's not enough, go look at our reviews. Read them and weep, haters. ConradReviews.com. You'll see more than a thousand five-star reviews. Our average review is 4.72 stars. Find out how much money you can save. Take control of your life in 2023 by taking control of your finances. We're going to show you how to keep more of your own money. If you've got credit card debt, what are you paying on that? 14%, 28%, you know, you can do better with the mortgage though. You may not know this. The interest you pay is tax deductible. And we can even show you how to skip your next two house payments. So if you can get a lower monthly payment, pay your debt off faster, get a greater tax deduction at the end of the year. And right now, right after the holidays, skip your next two payments, buddy, this is the biggest no brainer in the history of the world. Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. or Hey man, shoot me an email directly. Conrad at SaveWithConrad.com. <laughs>